Well, my primary priorities and my primary ambition was to demonstrate that Australia as a middle power, rather like Korea, not a great power, not able to impose our will on anybody through military or economic power, but as a middle power could really do some important and influential things. Not just obviously advancing our own security and our own economic interests, but also making the world and the region a better place through pursuing what we call global public goods issues or regional public goods issues, like the response to health pandemics and catastrophes and crises of one kind or another. The current issue, most obviously, of course, is climate change, which is unable to be addressed by any country acting alone and de demands cooperative action. Uh, but a whole range of issues, terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation and so on, really do need a lot of effective international cooperation. And I think what we tried to do in the Australian government and really succeeded quite well is in showing that a country of our size, like Korea, could really, could really make a difference. And I suppose the, the things that I'm particularly proud of are the role that we played in the Cambodian peace process, which had proved very intractable, very difficult in the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge genocide. There was a continuing civil war. And Australia came up with the creative idea and the diplomacy which basically brought that war to conclusion. I'm proud of the role that we played in creating architecture for policy dialogue in the Asia-Pacific region. The initiation of APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. The role that we played in encouraging ASEAN to develop the ASEAN Regional Forum for Security Dialogue at a ministerial level. And I'm proud also of the role that we played in arms control issues. We were the country that really did all the work that brought the chemical weapons prohibition treaty to a final conclusion after about 20 years of negotiation um, in Geneva without anything coming to a conclusion. I'm proud of the role that we played in initiating the Canberra Commission on the elimination of nuclear weapons. Not that we've succeeded in eliminating nuclear weapons, but I think we have done a lot through that commission particularly and later exercises of that kind to bring the world's attention to the absolute necessity to address that particular problem. I'm proud of the role that we played in helping bring an end to the apartheid regime in South Africa because it was Australia that really, Prime Minister Bob Hawke, me working with him, that came up with the idea of financial sanctions, not just sports boycotts and cultural boycotts and trade boycotts, which had not really been all that effective, even though people were obviously thought they were doing something good to put pressure on South Africa. It was the financial sanctions, cutting off the supply, getting the global financial system, the banking system, to deny the South African government and business the credit it needed to fuel the economy. That was really what finally brought the end of the apartheid regime together. And Australia played quite a central role in inventing that particular strategy and advocating its acceptance right around the world, starting with the Commonwealth countries, but United States, Europe, and so on. So there's a whole lot of things of that kind that I think we did through the process, not of exercising muscle, but the exercise of persuasion uh, through active, creative diplomacy and showing a bit of stamina in the way in which we would try to work away at issues and not just walk away from them when the initial frustrations came. I think it goes back to the time that I was a student where I had a lot of formative experiences traveling in Vietnam and Cambodia and elsewhere. But one very influential, moving experience for me was going as a student to Hiroshima in 1964 um, and going to the Peace Park there, the site of the atomic bomb, going into the museum and looking at one particular exhibit which I recall vividly to this day. It was just a granite stone which had been on the steps of a bank in the middle of Hiroshima 
against which someone had been sitting on a bright sunny morning in August when the bomb went off. And what you saw on the stone was the, the shadow of that person which was etched when they were incinerated by the blast but the crystallisation of the granite occurred at different rates because of the shadow of the person. And in a strange kind of a way, with all the other exhibits there, all the photographs, that made an indelible impression on me. And I said to myself then, if ever I have a chance of doing something to rid the world of these most indiscriminately inhumane weapons, the most indiscriminately inhumane weapons ever invented by mankind, I would like to do something. So I tried when I was foreign minister to initiate the Canberra Commission and things of this kind to try and begin to change the way the world thought about nuclear weapons, not to make assumptions about their deterrent utility, but to recognise the terrible, terrible dangers. And since then I've spent a lot of my time um, doing just that. Um, so far it's, it's very frustrating, but I think we have to work at it because the notion the notion that there is something stabilising about nuclear weapons, something that guarantees peace and security, I think is completely crazy. Even if, even if there's no real probability these days that anyone will deliberately initiate a nuclear war, because I think the understanding of the scale of the horror unleashed by that is pretty good. But the possibility of accident, the possibility of system error, of human error, of miscalculation, and particularly in the new cyber age, when the possibility of destroying communications and undermining the effectiveness, such as it is, of the command and control systems that exist, makes it very, very much more dangerous than people routinely believe. Policymakers, I think, have to be frightened into the recognition of just how much can go wrong. We've learned an awful lot from the opening of the Cold War archives about how many times the world came close to catastrophe through system error, human error, not so much through deliberate decision. And I strongly believe it's just sheer dumb luck that we have survived all those years without a nuclear catastrophe. And I don't believe that luck can continue much longer. We must work very, very hard to wind back the nuclear stockpiles and move towards a world without nuclear weapons at all. Yeah, well, I think there's too much disposition among policymakers to think that nuclear weapons are some kind of safety blanket, uh, that there is some advantage in deterring regime change attack or some way in which your security will be better guaranteed by having nuclear weapons. I think the evidence is overwhelmingly against that. I don't think nuclear weapons are a source of protection for anybody. I think they're a source of enormous risk, both for the countries that possess them and, of course, for the whole world. Because even a relatively small scale nuclear exchange, 50 weapons or so, in a world where we know we have you know, 15, 16 and a half, 17,000 nuclear weapons, just an exchange of 50 or so of them because of the devastating nuclear winter effect, which all the climate people know about, can create billions of casualties and just destroy life on planet as we know it. We know that climate is an existential risk, but nuclear weapons can kill us a hell of a lot faster than CO2. Well, I think Australians are increasingly aware, as is the rest of the world, about the dangers of nuclear weapons proliferation. I still think they're a little bit complacent about the existing nuclear weapons and worrying too much about new countries acquiring them without worrying enough about what can happen with the United States and Russia and China and so on. But I do think everybody in Australia would strongly believe in the denuclearization objective and strongly believe in the absolute necessity for an effective negotiation process to take place. 
I don't think there is much belief in Australia, at least among people who are following this debate, that North Korea is going to be bludgeoned into submission by sanctions or by threats or by pressure. I think the, the belief in Australia is strongly that there has to be a sensible step-by-step -step negotiation in which trust is built. And even though it's very difficult to have trust and confidence in someone like Kim Jong-un, in particular as information emerges that maybe he's back to his terrible tricks of executing his policy people that fail his aspirations, as news we've just been getting, uh, even though there's all that obvious problem about having any confidence in Kim Jong-un, my personal belief is, and the belief of many, many policy makers who've worked on nuclear issues, is that he does understand, the North Koreans do understand, that to use nuclear weapons aggressively themselves, to be homicidal in that sense would be to be suicidal, because even though they might have now a dozen or so weapons, even if they might have 20 or 30 weapons in you know, a year or two's time, even if they might get many more weapons than that, still they are facing overwhelming nuclear firepower against them and the country would be turned into, into rubble and the regime could not possibly survive were they to aggressive. So there's an emptiness, there's an emptiness and a posturing about the North Korean position, which I think does create the conditions for an effective negotiation. I mean, North Korea is very, very anxious about regime survival, but it's already got enough deterrent capability. I mean, Koreans know this better than anybody with the, the ring of rocket fire and missile artillery outside Seoul and the, the fantastic scale of the casualties that can be caused. The notion that you need nuclear weapons, that any country needs nuclear weapons for their protection, the notion that North Korea needs nuclear weapons, I think is, is nonsense. It's a psychological comfort, it's a political asset maybe to him domestically, maybe it gives him an opportunity to strut internationally and show off and give, get some kind of credibility for technical competence. But in terms of improving the position, the long-term position of North Korea, uh, nuclear weapons are not going to do it. So that's why I'm confident that at the end of the day, we can get to a negotiated solution. It's not a totally intractable situation. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that, zero chance. Again, just to state it again, for the reason that they must know that any aggressive, homicidal use of nuclear weapons would be suicidal. And, you know, you can say these guys are crazy, but I think most of us don't believe they're crazy. We think they're evil in many ways, but that's very different from being totally irrational. And also there is the fact that, I mean, Kim Jong-un knows that in the contemporary age, as much as he can try and stop the flow of information into the country, you know, through internet exclusion, all the rest of it. It's very difficult to run a completely isolated, closed off country. And he knows that his population is becoming ever more aware of how desperately poor they are economically, comparatively with the South, comparatively with the rest of the world. He knows he's got to do something to improve the situation of his people economically. And he knows that that can only happen when we move down a path uh, towards denuclearization and ultimately achieve that because sanctions are going to apply and the stranglehold is going to be there. So he knows that somehow that yoke has to be broken. I don't think sanctions, as I've said, are going to force him into changing his position, but the overall dynamics are such that the conditions are there. What it requires is a sensible approach on the part of all sides, and that means, of course, the United States as well. And if the United States sets the bar too high and makes impossible demands, which most of us would know that North Korea could not possibly accept, to dismantle everything before any of the sanctions are removed, for example, or even just to supply a list of every conceivable nuclear facility they have, a target list to the United States, to do that without some compensating 
guarantees along the way, reciprocal conditionality, um, the negotiations are not going to happen. But if those negotiations do happen, I think um, you know, we can be reasonably confident that however long it takes, we will get a solution. I cannot believe that there's any aggressive use of nuclear weapons that would make any sense at all from a North Korean perspective. Well, <laughs> the problem about any country retaining nuclear weapons is what I've already said, not so much the risk of them being used in deliberately in an aggressive fashion, but the risk of miscalculation, the risk of human error, the risk of system error, the risk of cyber um, sabotage or interruption of communications leading to people making panic decisions because they misunderstand you know, what is happening in what might be just a, a conventional weapon skirmish. And I mean, it's extraordinary how easily wrong things can go. I mean, the story I like best from the Cold War about this, because it makes the point so quickly and easily, during the Cuban confronta confrontation between the United States and Russia, we all know now that there were in fact nuclear weapons on Cuba and there were nuclear weapons on Soviet submarines that were in Cuban waters, nuclear tipped torpedoes. And, but the United States didn't know that at the time. It was mounting a naval blockade around Cuba and it was periodically dropping depth charges into the water, not so much to try to destroy the Soviet submarines, but to let them know that the US Navy was there and that they were being watched. One of those depth charges actually destroyed the communication system of one of the Russian submarines. And the particular protocol in place said that if, you are, if your communications are knocked out by some hostile act, you, the commander, have to assume that we are now at war and it's your decision as to whether to fire your nuclear weapon. The commander of the Russian submarine in question thought, my God, this is a very big responsibility. I have to make this decision. So he called in his deputy and also the, the other senior officer who, of the, the particular fleet. So the three of them said, we will, dis we will make this decision together. And by a two to one majority, World War III was averted because they decided not to fire their nuclear weapon. If that nuclear weapon had been fired, all hell would have broken out. So it came as close as that. And we know the other stories about flocks of birds being mistaken as incoming missiles. The sun shining on the underside of a cloud being mistaken as a missile launch. And the command and control systems are not that really sophisticated. And particularly when you introduce this new problem of cyber technology, cyber capacity to intrude in people's other countries' space technologically, so many more things can go wrong. So as long as nuclear weapons are retained by North Korea or anybody else, they are desperately dangerous for the peace of the region, peace of the world. And so if we can stop North Korea getting any more nuclear weapons, if we can at least freeze it and then start you know, negotiating a complete denuclearization, that's a very, very important objective. Because the worst thing that could possibly happen is that after all these years of relative restraint, we still only have nine countries with nuclear weapons and it was feared back in the 1960s that by within 20 years there'd be 30 or 40 countries with nuclear weapons. We're still keeping it under some kind of control. But once that sense that you can get away with having nuclear weapons. And when you combine that with that not objectively well-founded but psychological belief that there's some sort of comfort involved in having a deterrent capability, you know, off the proliferation race can, can start. And we're already seeing the beginning of an arms race again. China is building many more weapons than it previously was content with. Russia and the United States are not going backwards anymore. We still have very large numbers. So it's very, very important to maintain the pressure and to maintain the rage about nuclear weapons. And I hope very much the next generation of young people will pick up the, uh, 
you know, the cause where old guys like me are going to run out of steam. Well, I do in fact applaud President Trump for initiating the summits. I don't think he really understood very well any of the issues. I don't think he was driven in particular by any moral sense of outrage or determination to rid the world of nuclear weapons like President Obama had. I think he was totally narcissistic. He thought he could maybe do something through his own charm and brilliance that hadn't been accomplished by anyone else. But whatever his motives, I think it was the right thing to do to explore seriously the possibility of a negotiated solution, which the Obama administration failed to do. They just sat on their hands. They sat on their hands. They're just strategic patients. Well, strategic patients just saw North Korea going ahead and building its capability. That was not helpful at all. So at least Trump did that. But, you know, with people like John Bolton, who you know, is the least diplomatic diplomat I've ever met in my entire life, uh, with him giving some kind of advice and Trump's inability to behave in a consistent and rational fashion, uh, I don't think the negotiations have been conducted very well. It's fairly obvious, even though we don't know the back story, it's fairly obvious that at least on the United States side, impossibly tough demands were being made of the North Koreans in the Hanoi summit. Uh, maybe they were impossibly tough going back the other way as well. But um, the point is, if you're going to embark on a negotiation on something as complex as this, the only way you're going to get a solution is through step-by-step -step trust building, confidence, reciprocal responses. You do this, we'll do that, you do this, and you build the confidence. Not every negotiation is like this. I mean. Israel-Palestine is a different kind of negotiation. That can't be step by step because every time you try to do it that way, the negotiation becomes hostage to the extremists on both sides. But something like a nuclear negotiation with North Korea has to be that kind. And with a, you know, with a Trump and the US side at the moment has the patience and the intelligence to mount such uh, an approach, I have my doubts. And of course, if you have to have doubts about the professionalism on the North Korean side, if it is the case that um, every time something goes wrong in the negotiations, the negotiator gets executed, as the current reports are saying, which is not a, not a happy situation for any creative diplomacy on the North Korean side. But the underlying dynamics are so obviously demanding a negotiated solution to this, and most people can see a way through this and accompanying it with the right institutional structures, a comprehensive peace agreement, uh, a nuclear weapons free zone, which doesn't mean that Russia and China and the United States would have to give away their nuclear weapons. It just means they have to guarantee they won't use them in this particular context with Japan and the two Koreas. If you build that and the new armistice peace agreement and so on, and just create the, the confidence that a cooperative solution is there for the taking and can be delivered, then I think we, we can get there without a catastrophe. But it's going to be a very rocky ride for the period ahead. Well, I don't think President Moon needs that advice. Moon Jae-in and his advisors like um, Chung In Moon, they know perfectly well the way this negotiation has to be conducted. And they've been saying as much quietly. I think, I think they've just got their heads around this the right way. It is a step by step. It's identifying, you do this, we'll do that, you do this, you do that. And in the meantime, you exercise restraint and we exercise restraint. And then you, you remove the sanctions in return for you know, positive moves on the other side. You don't take all the sanctions off at once simply because one particular facility is dismantled. Of course not. It's a very complex business, the calibration of sanctions removal. But we have lots of examples of that process at work and a sophisticated negotiation with the kind of intelligence which I think the present, the present South Korean government is bringing to this 
which I'm not sure is replicated in Washington, but I think if we follow what the present South Korean government is saying, I think we can get there. I know that's not a completely universal view in South Korea. There's many of people on the more conservative side of politics who say you just can't make these concessions and you just put pressure, 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 more and more sanctions, grind them into the dust, threaten them with, uh, with a Holocaust militarily. But my very strong belief, and I've had a lot of experience of this stuff, my very strong belief is this has to be a trust building process. You see, I was around with the 95, 96 negotiations. Australia was a small player, but in the Cato negotiations and in supplying fuel oil and so on. And I saw that fall apart, fall, fall apart, not because it was impossible that North Korea was ever going to agree, but because both sides, and in particular the Western side, the US side, did not fully deliver on its side of the deal, and the trust was, was broken. And then, of course, you know, the axis of evil and all the rest of the, the stuff that happened thereafter. And now we have you know, the example of the United States walking away from the Iran Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. So obviously, on the other side, however awful the other side is, however difficult the other side may be, how are they going to be persuaded to trust a United States which enters into a deal and then walks away from it? This is very serious and very troubling. But so that's why we can't be too impatient. We have to rebuild and the United States has to put stuff on the table, small stuff, and then honour it and just let that build up. And you've got to stop people like Bolton and others just talking you know, crazy stuff because it, it utterly, Pompeo, it all diminishes the capacity of the other side to make concessions themselves and to move the game forward. I think think tanks are very important players in the contemporary world in doing research in a way that is sometimes beyond the capacity of governments to, to think about doing because they lack imagination, they, got, they get caught in particular grooves and particular ruts. It's the capacity of think tanks, research institutes to think outside the box, not be constrained by the disciplines of the institution, but to think about new kinds of solutions to familiar problems. And then, of course, to generate debate and discussion about those ideas. That doesn't always happen inside governments. You know, people get caught in their particular, this is a departmental position, this is a departmental position, and, you know, the senior, the junior people look to the senior people, and it can be very difficult to break out and to have develop new thinking. So new thinking, effective advocacy, analysis advocacy is very, very important. Also, of course, think tanks can energise public opinion. And governments, any democratic government, is always looking to public opinion, the wider community, to be confident about taking particular courses of action. But think tanks and non-government organisations you know, can get out there and generate important public debate. And big conferences like this, Joju, particularly with lots of young people um, involved and participating and hopefully being energised by that debate, you know, can create over time uh, the kind of mindset changes that I often talk about and create momentum for doing things differently. Because the world is changing all the time around us. The strategies, the tactics uh, that contribute to security that might have worked 20, 30 years ago are just not... Well, the issues are different, the preoccupations are different, the technology is different. The world is changing, so you have to be quick on your feet in the way in which you respond to that and quick in your mind about analysing the new environment that you're in and creating effective ways of making the world safer and saner and more just when it comes to human rights uh, types issues as well as pure security issues.